Hey there. This. This is the M7 Priest. A self-propelled artillery vehicle equipped with a 105mm howitzer. The M7 was built and first deployed during World War II. However, it would see extensive action only a few short years later in a war that grew out of World War II. That's right, the Korean War was an unintended consequence of World War II. And technically, it never ended. When World War II ended, Korea was liberated from Japanese control by the Soviet Union and American forces. It was agreed that the Soviet Union would help rebuild the North and the United States would assist the South. As a result, two separate Koreas were created, the North and the South, separated by the 38th parallel, a circle of latitude on the globe. Each Korea had its own government and each claimed the entirety of the peninsula as their own. In June of 1950, North Korean forces invaded the South with the support of the Soviet Union and China. The United Nations Security Council voted to send a force to support South Korea. The vast majority of that UN force was American, with some 326,000 American troops sent to the fight. The Korean War would last until July of 1953, when an armistice was signed suspending combat operations and creating a buffer to separate North and South Korea, the Korean Demilitarized Zone, or DMZ. But what's to prevent the conflict from starting up again? What sort of deterrence keeps the North from once more attempting to invade? This is the Joint Security Area in the Korean Demilitarized Zone, as it looks today. South Korean guards engage in an almost ceremonial face-off against their North Korean counterparts 365 days a year. A concrete line clearly divides North from South. But is that line enough to keep the peace? This is the North Korean village of Kijongdong. The North Korean government maintains that it is home to families who work the surrounding farmland. They say it is a model village for the South to see. And it looks clean and orderly, yet close scrutiny reveals that the concrete structures are in fact empty facades. No rooms within, no glass in the windows. The only noticeable activity in this ghost town is the propaganda broadcasts. And the 600-pound flag waving high above the rooftops. In the 1980s, the South Koreans erected a flagpole 100 meters tall. Not to be outdone, the North Koreans built one of their own, 160 meters tall, then the tallest flagpole in the world. Such history of one-upmanship has long existed between the two Koreas. Action by one provokes action by the other and such action has not been limited to the height of their flagpoles. So far there's been an asymmetrical relationship the last 20 years between North Korea and South Korea, and it runs something like this. That North Korea has been able to violate conditions surrounding the use and respect for the demilitarized zone. That North Korea has killed South Koreans, kidnapped Japanese, sent missiles into the airspace, of other nations in the, in the region sent boats in sh to their sea space, uh, territorial waters. And all of that's been predicated on the idea that they're lunatic and that a oppressive cadre is not acting as representatives of 30 million people who are forced to eat grass and are suffering. Many would say that North Korea is a very unpredictable foe. And I would argue they're fairly predictable because they tend to antagonize, provoke, appease, and demand concessions. And they tend to continue to run in this cycle. And when there is a provocation, what should our response be? What's the balance between deterrence and appeasement? But I, I don't think you can do one or the other in the Koreas. I think you have to do both. Why do you think both appeasement and deterrence would be necessary? When dealing with a nation as provocative as North Korea, what does this mix of concessions and force look like? The Bridge of No Return is a controlled crossing between North and South. Nearby is a small placard. 
It commemorates an event that occurred in 1976, an event remembered as the Axe Murder Incident. George Chobani was enlisted in the U.S. Army and stationed at the Joint Security Area at the time of the incident. Okay, so I'm going to start with this one. A KPA guard in front of his checkpoint with his binoculars in his, what I would call, his aggressive stance. And that's pretty much what we looked at on a day-to-day -day basis. The North Koreans are very stern. They had their best troops in the, their positions just as we had ours in ours. Every day when you went to work, you had to be prepared for something to happen. And you've probably heard the term, you know, hours of boredom punctuated by moments of terror. That's sort of the way it was there. This picture is day-to-day -day operations within the Joint Security Forces. It shows two American soldiers, one with binoculars, one with a camera. This checkpoint actually looks out over the tree and the uh, bridge of no return. Each spring, the view from one of the observation posts on the South Korean side was obstructed by the leaves of a large tree. It was decided that a UN work party would be sent to trim the tree. We, we nicknamed the people, excuse the, the term, Lieutenant Bad and he was bigger than most North Koreans. And anytime he showed up, there was some kind of incident. Here's the Korean civilians beginning to trim the tree. North Korean KPA, we call them Korean People's Army, a couple of trucks arrived and KPA started to get off. And all of a sudden, from around one of their checkpoints comes out, Lieutenant Bad So we knew something was going to happen. Uh, you can start to see some discussions here between uh, Captain Boniface and the, uh, the lieutenant. For whatever reason, the North Koreans raised some objections, one of which was Kim Il-sung, who's the first of the three uh, North Korean leaders. He planted the tree and it had some you know, sacred positioning and the North Koreans didn't want it to be trimmed. Lieutenant Bad will blast us. I watched him because I was on the side of him. I watched him. He took his glasses off. He rolled them up in a handkerchief and he stuck them in his pocket. I mean, he did this methodical. And then that's when he gave the order. The order he gave was to kill them all. So here's the, the mass of people engaging in the fight. You can see that it is tools, you know, picks and axes that are being used against the, the Americans. I went around and Captain Boniface was down and his head was split open and his glasses, they hit him here and his glasses just, just broke in half. There's Captain Boniface on the ground, so again, it was apparent he was down very quickly. And they were still there chopping Captain Boniface when I got to the checkpoint. So that was his last duty and he got killed on, it, on the last duty because he was flying out the next day. The Americans deliberated for a few days, then determined that a show of force was necessary. Operation Paul Bunyan was named after the giant lumberjack of American folklore. And this time, the North Koreans' favorite tree wouldn't be trimmed. It would be removed altogether. Operation Paul Bunyan was the most heavily militarized and military defended tree trimming operation ever in the entire world. We, in the joint security area, had this feeling that um, everything was lined up behind us, ready to go to war. And what was lined up behind us was helicopter gunships. Behind them, B-52s were circling, ready if the word was given to drop bombs. And, and then once the Midway, an aircraft carrier, moved in from the Sea of Japan, uh, they were flying jet sorties off the Midway in support of that. As far as we were concerned, it might have been the start of the next round of the Korean War. It wasn't a scary time. The Army engineers cut the tree down, leaving the stump behind as a reminder. North Korean soldiers did arrive, but they only stood and watched. This show of force acted as a deterrent, stopping the one upmanship for a time. Does a North Korean provocation automatically elicit a U.S. response? No. But it does elicit considering what a response might be, whether it be kinetic or whether it be a show of force or whether it be sanctions. Over 30 years, North Korea has found a formula of feigned madness 
and threat to develop nuclear weapons or the possession of nuclear weapons. And when you weld those two factors together or you combine them, it has a formula to get massive foreign aid and to develop a global voice influence that's not commiserate with its small population and dismal economy. And they're not going to give that up. They're going to increase that, that method of operation. So they're going to get more nukes and they're going to talk more as if they were unhinged. All attempts to stop the North Koreans from building, acquiring uh, nuclear technology have failed. The key reason that this is dangerous is not that North Korea is going to attack the United States unprovoked. It's the danger of uh, a rogue regime with the ultimate weapon that can essentially defy its neighbors and become increasingly uh, a source of instability in the region. Would the unpredictable and now nuclear-armed North Korean government concede to a show of force and curtail its aggressive behavior, as was the effect of Operation Paul Bunyan? Or would a show of force invite escalating violence? When the stakes are so high, is deterrence worth the risk? What do you think? <laughs>